Welcome to the video for chapter 6.3, Defense Against Infectious Diseases, which is IB's fancy way of saying we're going to talk about the immune system. Okay, now you're going to hear me reference this word pathogen several times. Okay, a pathogen is any organism or virus, not the same because viruses aren't living, that's capable of causing some kind of a disease. So keep in mind when we refer to things like Down syndrome, okay, or phenylketonuria, PKU, those are syndromes, they're not diseases. Diseases are communicable, contagious things caused by pathogens. All right, so some common bacterial diseases, E. coli poisoning, tetanus, which we get from uh, soil bacteria, and strep throat here, those are all bacterial diseases. Okay, some common viral diseases, the common cold, uh, the flu, HIV, AIDS. Fungal diseases can include things like this athlete's foot, Okay, ringworm, aspergillus, which we uh, can get an infection of that fungus in our lungs. And then protozoal diseases, so uh, diseases caused by these little, usually uh, single-celled organisms, can include malaria, uh, which we get from mosquito bites, toxoplasmosis, we get that from coming into contact with cat poop, and this giardia, okay, which we can get by drinking contaminated water. Okay, so all these things, really not so fun. But when we say pathogen, we can really mean any of these things. Now, your body has a lot of really cool ways to fight pathogens, but the best way to fight them is pre to prevent them from getting in in the first place, okay? So we call this the primary defense, okay, the first defense. And this is really going to involve the skin, and mucous membranes, okay? And so their job is really a preventative job to keep those pathogens from ever getting into your tissues or your bloodstream. So your skin, your largest organ of your body, is super cool. Uh, it's got several layers. Um, the top layer is mostly dead cells, okay? So these are cells which are dead, okay, they're not getting a lot of blood flow, okay, this is one of the reasons why we shed them a lot, uh, and it provides a really good barrier for things that are trying to get in there. Mucous membranes, we'll talk more about those in just a minute, okay, um, they're going to line the entry points to your body, okay, so places that aren't covered by skin, more on that in a minute. That mucus is really sticky and it can trap the pathogens so they can't get into the interior of your body. And then some of them are lined with these hair-like projections called cilia. All right, so before we talk about cilia some more, let's talk about some of these important mucus membranes. We need these guys anywhere there's a hole. Okay, so we don't need them here. There's no hole there, okay? We really need them anywhere that we have a hole on the outside of our body. So that's gonna be our trachea, our nasal passages, okay? Also our mouth, but I didn't list that there. Our urethra, I didn't, pay, <laughs> I didn't include that in the picture. And the vagina, so any entrance into the body. Um, also a good reason, just FYI, not to pick your nose, okay? When you pick your nose, you're removing the mucus that's in that nose. You're also introducing pathogens that were on your hand now into uh, the inside of your body. So probably amongst a lot of other reasons, really not good to do that uh, for your immune system's sake. Okay, so those cilia we just mentioned, those hair-like projections, okay, they're part of cells and they can produce a wave-like movement that traps the pathogen and moves them out of those mucus lined tissues. So here's the trachea, okay? And so we have these cells and these cells have these cilia on them. Some people can get confused between cilia, which was what we're looking at here, and pili, okay? Which uh, they may look similar, but remember pili belong to prokaryotes, okay? They're for exchanging of those plasmids. Cilia, I'm going to find on eukaryotes, I should be able to see uh, a nucleus here. But I digress, okay? So those cilia are going to produce this wave-like motion upwards so that any pathogens that they trap move out. We want them moving back out, okay? And we don't want them moving into our tissues. That's, that's bad. 
Okay, now before we start talking about what happens if a pathogen does make it past those primary defenses, um, let's talk about the blood because the blood is probably going to be where they end up. So we need to figure out what kind of stuff I'm going to find in the blood. So first I'm going to find this fluid water-based substance called the plasma. In the plasma, I'm going to have a bunch of things, mostly water, okay, dissolved stuff, uh, including proteins. Cells uh, are, I'm, was what I'm also going to find. Okay, so I'm going to find red blood cells, these guys, white blood cells, um, which is these guys, and platelets, so these little cell fragments. All of these things are going to become important in our immune defense. Well, except for these guys, but they're the coolest, so we'll let them stay in our list for now. Now, there are lots of ways for pathogens to get into your body. Um, a really common way that things get in there is through a cut. So I'm thinking of something like tetanus, okay? Tetanus is a soil bacteria, so if it's on like a nail or something, and then you puncture your skin and it has that bacteria on it, that pathogen can make its way into the bloodstream. So cuts and punctures are a really good opportunity for those pathogens to make it in past your body's primary defense, which is the skin. Blood clots, okay, are super important because they kind of plug the hole, okay? So if I have a hole um, and no pathogens have already gotten in here, then that blood clot will help prevent any naughty little uh, pathogens from being able to get through the skin and into the bloodstream. So blood clotting is going to involve a few of the different components of the blood. The first thing I'm gonna need is something called fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is a protein, okay, and it's dissolved in the blood plasma. It's one of the things that you might have already learned about uh, that's produced by the liver. The second thing I'm gonna find in there is another plasma protein called prothrombin. Okay, so another pro plasma protein. And then I'm gonna find platelets. Platement, platelets are cell fragments and they're made in the bone marrow. They're not real cells, they're just little cell pieces. Okay, so let's say I have a cut. Okay, how am I gonna form a blood clot? Well, after the rupturing of that blood vessel, okay, we're gonna see the release of chemicals that cause platelets to stick to the damaged area. Okay, so I have some kind of a rupture. That ruptured blood vessel sends out little chemical messengers into your bloodstream that says like calling all platelets, calling all platelets, okay? And it causes those platelets to stick to those uh, damaged blood, uh, blood vessel areas. All right, the damaged tissue releases chemicals called clotting factors, okay? So in addition to releasing chemicals that cause platelets to come in, they release clotting factors. And these clotting factors are kind of triggers uh, that are gonna convert prothrombin into thrombin, okay? So this guy's kind of like the Hulk, and I always forget what the Hulk is when he's not super mad, but that guy's name. <laughs> um, we're gonna convert prothrombin into its gnarly, awesome, super cool thrombin form. Okay, that thrombin is then gonna act as an enzyme to convert fibrinogen into an insoluble form called fibrin, okay? So thrombin is kind of like the super awesome gnarly version of prothrombin. Fibrin is the super awesome crazy cool version of fibrinogen. The fibrin is gonna form a mesh Okay, that's gonna trap cellular debris and forms a clot. So down here, you can see this like black netting type thing. And that net is going to trap a bunch of cells and other things, and it's going to form a clot and plug that hole. Okay, so maybe let's draw this out in a series of steps. Okay, so first I'm gonna have damage to the uh, a blood vessel, okay? Let's hope it's not a big blood vessel. That could be bad. Okay, that's gonna send out chemical signals to the platelets. Okay, and the platelets are going to stick 
to, let's just say, the opening, okay, to the damaged part. So that's one part of the blood clotting. The other thing that this damaged blood vessel is going to do is it's going to send out chemical symbols that are going to turn prothrombin into thrombin. Well, I guess I got to draw that maybe below. Okay, thrombin then acts as an enzyme, okay, to turn fibrinogen into fibrin. Okay, so thrombin, again, is an enzyme that helps make this conversion from fibrinogen into fibrin, okay, and this fibrin then forms that mesh that for, like covers that area and creates something for blood vessels and other crap to get stuck in and form a clot, okay? So there we have the clotting sequence. Okay, now let's say your skin and mucous membranes have failed you. The pathogen is in your bloodstream, okay? The clotting didn't help you, or maybe it didn't come in through a clot. Maybe it came in through your lungs or something like that. When you are infected with a pathogen, okay, you are going to incur what's called a primary immune response. So this is a series of events that's going to occur during the body's first encounter with a particular pathogen. So whenever you meet a certain pathogen for the very first time, we're gonna have a primary immune response. A secondary immune response is a different series of events um, when it's inv invaded by that same pathogen that it's previously been infected with. And this just isn't the second time. Maybe it's the second time, maybe it's the 10th time, maybe it's the 212th time, okay? Any time after uh, it meets that pathogen uh, for the very first time, we call that secondary, okay? So primary, the very first time, secondary, any other time it meets that pathogen. Now your primary response is slow. There's a lot of crap that has to happen. We'll go through that later. Okay, but the primary response can usually take a week or more to completely get rid of that pathogen if it's able to do it at all. So we have rather severe symptoms because while your body is taking its sweet time to get rid of that pathogen, that pathogen is wreaking havoc on some of your body tissues and causing you all kinds of uncomfortable symptoms. Okay, the secondary response is a whole heck of a lot faster, okay, and symptoms are either going to be milder or they may be non-existent, okay? You may not even feel anything from the secondary immune response. And that's really because, okay, once we're meeting something for the second time, we're able to create a lot more antibodies a lot quicker because we've already met that guy. All right, now we've got some major players on the scene when it comes to the immune response, okay? Um, let's stick to thinking about primary for now. So we're gonna have two role players here, okay? One of them is called a macrophage, and it has another name. It's also sometimes called a phagocytic leukocyte. So phagocytosis, which is a type of endocytosis, so it's bringing in something large into its cell by the infolding of the membrane. Hopefully you know what I'm talking about. If not, Google it and then pretend like you knew it all along. Okay, and then leuco means white, and then cyte means cell. So this literally translates into, well, macro means big. So it literally translates into a big white cell that eats things. Okay, so this is involved in something that we call non-specific immunity. This big macrophage just runs around in your body, feeling up on other cells. It reads and recognizes pathogens, so it's going to feel up on a cell. If it belongs to your body, it leaves it alone. If it doesn't recognize a cell, it's going to assume that it's a pathogen and then engulf and destroy it via phagocytosis. 
The other type of cell, okay, is something called a plasma cell, and you may also hear it referred to as a B cell. They are both types of white blood cells, okay, so both of them, okay, but this one doesn't have anything in the name that would suggest that. Plasma cells are involved in specific immunity, and that's because they produce antibodies, and we need a different antibody for each pathogen. Okay, so these guys are nonspecific. They don't care what it is. As long as it doesn't belong there, it's eating it. These guys will only work for one particular pathogen. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about these macrophages or phagocytic leukocytes. So again, the first thing that's gonna happen is it's gonna read the proteins on the outside of the pathogen. So remember, pathogens like this one have cell membranes. Within their membranes, they have membrane proteins. And one of the functions of a membrane protein is cell recognition. It's got these little proteins on the outside that are kind of like name tags. So this macrophage is going to read those uh, proteins and it's gonna recognize that the pathogen isn't supposed to be there. It wasn't invited to our party. So it's going to engulf that pathogen via phagocytosis. Again, that's a form of endocytosis. It makes a dent in the cell membrane that cell membrane pinches off, and now that pathogen is on the inside of the cell wrapped up in a vesicle made of what used to be that part of the cell membrane. Google it, it's real. Okay, on the inside of this macrophage, I'm gonna have a crap load of these little sacs called lysosomes, and you remember those, I'm sure. Lysosomes contain tons of enzymes. So the lysosomes are going to merge with that uh, vesicle filled with that pathogen, and those enzymes are gonna destroy that pathogen. Again, this is what we call nonspecific, okay? The macrophage doesn't know who the heck this is, it just knows that it doesn't belong in the body. Okay, now one of the annoying parts about learning about the immune system is the fact that there are a bunch of words that sound like they are the same, but they mean very different things. Okay, so we're going to talk about like good guys and bad guys here. Let's pick a color for bad guys. How about red? Okay, the antigen is the membrane protein found on the outside of a pathogen. So antigens are found on pathogens, okay? And they're kind of like the calling card um, so that they can be recognized, okay? That's how those macrophages and then other cells are gonna realize that they don't belong there, okay? So those are these guys, okay? These little proteins found on the outside of a pathogen. The antibodies, these are our good guys, okay? They're also a protein, but they're not on a membrane, okay? They're just floating around in the cytoplasm. They do not belong to a cell. They're free and independent. And they happen to be Y-shaped. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail later on, okay? And they can only attach to specific pathogens. So you can see here how the shape of the antigen fits into the shape of the receptor on the antibody. So that's why I need a different antibody for each type of pathogen, okay? So antibodies, again, are very specific to each pathogen. They're like what we talked about uh, with enzymes, a lock and a key. Anytime we're talking about antibodies, Okay, we need to be thinking again about something called specific immunity. Non-specific immunity was the macrophages, okay? Specific immunity involves those plasma cells, those B cells, and the little Y-shaped proteins they make called antibodies. Again, we call it specific because each pathogen needs its own antibody. They will only fit onto one. So how do I know if I'm infected with strep throat that my body is going to be able to make the right antibody? Well, this is what's called your specific immunity again, okay? And there are some very um, concrete steps to help your body understand what antibodies to produce. Okay, so first we're going to have to identify what antigen that is. 
okay? Um, that involves a whole complex series of steps that you'll learn about in higher level, okay? But that antigen is identified. We know that it's strep throat, okay? In your um, lymph nodes, you have thousands of different types of plasma cells. So I have all of these different guys, okay? And they each do something different, okay? And I need to find the specific plasma cell that can produce the specific antibody that I need for that antigen. So we're going to eliminate all the ones that don't make what we need. Once we find the one that, we ma that makes what we need, then that one is going to clone itself. Okay, so I need a bunch more of these guys because that's the thing that makes the antibodies that I need, okay? So if I'm talking about cloning itself, I'm gonna be undergoing mitosis. All these clones are going to produce these antibodies, okay? So they're going to produce tons and tons of antibodies. We're going to release them into the bloodstream, okay? Release the hounds. Send out these antibodies to go kill those pathogens. These antibodies are going to eliminate those pathogens. There are many ways that that can happen. You don't need to know them right this second. Okay, and then once I've fought all the pathogens, okay, once all the pathogens are gone, I don't really need these antibodies anymore. Okay, these guys have become unnecessary. So that means that I don't need these antibodies and I also don't need all of these extra B cells, okay? So some of them, I'm gonna get rid of those, but some of them I'm going to keep in the bloodstream, okay? And they're going to morph into what we call a memory cell. So memory cells are gonna remain in the bloodstream. And they're just gonna hang out there making sure everything's going good. And they're gonna stay in the blood so that they can respond quickly if the same pathogen is ever encountered again. That's why our secondary immune response is so much faster, better, more awesome, gives us less symptoms. All of this stuff involved with the primary immune response takes a while, okay? But once we have all of these memory cells floating around in our bloodstream, okay, that secondary immune response can kick in rather quickly, and that's why we don't feel the symptoms as much. Okay, so in case you noticed how utterly terrible my diagram was, here's what we were talking about. Okay, so I have a bunch of different B cells. I gotta find the B cell that matches the antigen that I have. Okay, so that's going to copy itself and make all these plasma cells. The plasma cells are going to release antibodies into the bloodstream. Some of them are going to remain memory cells, and I'm gonna keep those in my bloodstream too, so that in case I ever encounter this antigen again, I have plenty of these ready to roll. So how do we develop an immune system? Okay, well, some plasma cells capable of producing antibodies are passed from mother to child in the very first breastfeeding. And I mean like the very first, not on the first day, not in the first week, but like the first breast milk that comes out. It's called colostrum. And it has a ton of antibody producing cells, these plasma cells in them. It's why breastfeeding is so highly encouraged shortly after birth. The rest just have to be developed over time, okay? And so this is a little bit of an exposure process, genetics process, etc. It's also one of the reasons why you have to be really careful about what you feed babies. They haven't fully developed their immune system. They're not as cool as you are yet, okay? So we have to limit what kind of exposure they have, okay, to things like honey. Honey has bacteria in them. Your immune system has the cells to be able to fight off that bacterium, babies not so much, okay? Um, so we have to be really careful here with preemies, okay? Some preemies are born too soon uh, and their digestive system can't handle breast milk, okay? They have to be fed um, via IV fluids. 
If that's the case, then they're not going to get that first breastfeeding. They're not going to get that colostrum, and they're not going to have um, a head start on producing those immune cells. So we have to be really careful with them. It's one of the reasons they stay in the ICU sometimes, uh, because that makes them really susceptible to common infections. So one of the pathogens um, that's a hot topic these days in the world of immunology is the HIV virus. And HIV stands for human immunodeficiency virus, okay? So it sounds like a long word, but you can figure out what this means. Immuno, referring to your immune system. Deficiency, uh, I don't have enough of something. So what the HIV virus does, and that's this guy, is it destroys some of the antibody producing plasma cells. Okay, if you're taking higher level later, you're gonna have to kind of go into a little bit more detail. It doesn't exactly work that way, but it kills healthy helper cells. And when you kill those healthy helper cells, you won't be able to utilize those plasma cells. Okay, when all of those have been destroyed, okay, this thing slowly attacks um, some of the white blood cells in our body. Okay, when it has sufficiently destroyed all of them or most of them, then it's no longer classified as HIV, it's called AIDS. And AIDS stands for Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. Okay, so let's take a look at a graph, okay, to show how over time, okay, these white blood cells, not really the macrophages, okay, but the ones involved in specific immunity are going to change over time. We're also gonna add in an axis over here because here we're gonna track the number of viruses in the bloodstream, okay? So we should be able to see a relationship between these white blood cells and the numbers of HIV viruses in our bloodstream over time. Okay, so I'm gonna track these immune cells in green. So usually we start off with a pretty high number of them. When I get HIV, those are gonna to start to go down. That virus is killing those cells. Okay, I'm gonna track number of viruses in red. Okay, so as we're acquiring this infection, the number of viruses is going up. So that kind of makes sense to me. As we get more and more viruses, and these viruses are killing the white blood cells, that white blood cell count is going down. Now, these viruses are going to enter a stage of dormancy, okay? So this period of dormancy can last for years, two years, 50 years, okay, it depends on a lot of factors, but after their initial spike here, they go into a series or a period of time called dormancy. Notice it doesn't go all the way down to zero, okay, zero would be down here. It doesn't go all the way down there, but it kind of levels off at like an acceptable level. And because we have a decrease in viruses, okay, these white blood cells are going to go back up but they're not gonna go all the way back up, okay, to their original level, okay? They're still kind of depressed, okay? They're still not where they should be. After a period of dormancy, okay, this virus is again going to start to replicate, replicate, replicate out of control. And as that virus count increases, okay, our white blood cell count goes down. Okay, so let's kind of put some labels on some things we've just talked about, okay? This period of time here was, again, our primary infection, okay? And this is where we see the symptoms, okay? So flu-like symptoms, fever, et cetera. It's not anything super specific. You might just think you had the flu, um, but the symptoms of that primary infection are gonna occur pretty early. Okay, and then we're gonna enter into a period called latency, okay? So this is where the virus is dormant. Okay, we experience no symptoms, 
okay? Our white blood cell count is still a little depressed, but overall we're not really feeling all of that bad. And this can go on for years, okay? So this is usually over a couple of weeks, Okay, and then this graph isn't really to scale because we would need like 8,000 feet to stretch all this out. Okay, this part can take years. Okay, once that virus starts to replicate out of control and really decimate our white blood cell counts, this is what we term as AIDS. Okay, and so no one actually ever dies of AIDS. You don't need white blood cells to sustain life. Okay, but what we're going to see here is uh, something called opportunistic. Yeah, I had no chance of fitting that. Opportunistic diseases. Okay, so things like pneumonia, things like the flu, things like even the common cold that normally I would have tons of white blood cells to fight off. Now I don't have tons of them they're really low levels. So these opportunistic diseases are taking advantage of that. And these are what actually kills you. No one dies of AIDS. They die of complications from AIDS, okay? Other diseases that can kill a person because they have very few white blood cells here. This can also take up to a few years, okay? This depends a lot on drug therapy and um, the extent to which you've been infected and been treated. Um, but yeah, so probably not as long as this latency period, um, but definitely not something that you'd think of as quickly as this one. So how was HIV transmitted? Okay. So two major ways that we find often in epidemiological studies is unprotected sex, and it has to be with an infected person. You can't just get it because the gods are angry at you for having unprotected sex. It doesn't work that way. It has to be unprotected sex with an infected person or sharing a hypodermic needle. So either way, what that involves is an exchange of body fluids. Okay, either blood or semen or vaginal secretions. Um, it could also be um, through some of the anal secretions as well. Now the problem is, is that there's no way to tell if a person is infected. If they're in that latency period, they're not going to have any symptoms. So there are a lot of people that are just unaware that they even have it. Okay, you won't even know if you meet them. Okay, so if we don't have it and we're not getting treated, then we have um, multiple opportunities to spread that HIV virus to others, and it can be really dangerous. There is some risk to the baby uh, during childbirth, not a ton. You know, mom and baby don't actually share blood the way that you think they do, so it's not an automatic thing that if mom has it, baby has it too. It doesn't work that way, um, but there can be some risk there. Notice you cannot get it from sneezing on someone, kissing someone, shaking someone's hand, etc. Okay, these are the major modes of transmission. So one of the things that's not going to help you with HIV uh, are antibiotics, okay? So the way that antibiotics work, this is so cool, is usually by disrupting the building of prokaryotic cell walls, Okay, so what we need to do if we want to invent an antibiotic is we need to find something that ruins a process that is unique to prokaryotes. We don't want it to be something that happens in eukaryotes too, because then when I take the antibiotic, it's going to be killing my own body cells in addition to that bacteria. Uh, no, thank you. Okay, so we want to either disrupt the building of the cell wall or maybe something that happens in the protein translation process. We want to disrupt that. Taking an antibiotic for a viral infection like the cold is useless and stupid, okay? Viruses don't make their own cell walls, okay? They don't make their own proteins, they trick their host into doing all of that for them. Remember, they inject their DNA into the host cell's genome. Then the host cell's like, ooh, that's my DNA. I guess I'll do what it tells me to do. And it does all the work for them. So if viruses aren't making cell walls or proteins, antibiotics don't work on them. And if you're taking antibiotics when you shouldn't be, then you're part of the problem that's leading to antibiotic-resistant strains of some really gnarly bacteria and we're all going to hate you and judge you. 
Okay, so even though we're going to blame you, throw rocks at you, I don't know, okay, punish you in some way, uh, it's not entirely your fault, okay, some of that blame um, falls on the prokaryotes themselves, okay? So remember, we're trying to target something that is unique to prokaryotes, okay? Um, and even within prokaryotes, we still have some genetic uh, variation. Bacteria reproduce asexually through a process called binary fission. It's a little bit like mitosis, okay? But um, the chromosome has a different structure, so... Uh, we have a different name, okay? And so wait a minute, hold on. If they're just making copies of themselves, if they're asexual, then how are we getting genetic variation? Well, one of a couple ways. Either these bacteria are sharing plasmids, those accessory loops of DNA, with other cells via their pili, or they have some kind of a mutant gene, okay? So they have some kind of a form of a gene, could be a mutation, that allows them to resist the antibiotic, okay? So again, within a population of bacteria, I might have a couple of them that have a special gene that allows them to just resist that antibiotic. When you take an antibiotic, you're going to kill all of the weaklings, all of the ones that don't have those genes, okay? And what you're gonna leave behind are the resistant ones, but now these resistant ones don't have to compete with these other guys. They don't have to compete for food or space or resources. And because they're not competing, they're going to replicate and replicate and replicate. So now I have a whole population of bacteria that are all resistant to that antibiotic. Um, and that is not a good situation. That's how we end up with things like MRSA, okay, methicillin resistant. Methicillin is a type of antibiotic. So methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, that's a type of bacteria that particularly in, likes to infect skin, okay? And so it doesn't matter what I take, I cannot get rid of this. So again, part of that blame is on uh, the bacteria just for having those mutant genes. And part of that um, comes from human behavior, specifically not taking full doses. So whenever you're prescribed an antibiotic, okay, you're going to notice that there's, oh my God, an instruction label. And guess what? The doctors and pharmacists who gave this to you are smarter than you. I promise that's true. Okay, so they tell you how much to take and they also tell you how long to take it for. It's not because they're trying to bleed your wallet, okay? It's because that's the number of days that's required for the full course of treatment. Okay, so even these super crazy resistant strains, okay, um, have a breaking point, right? So maybe day one of antibiotics doesn't work. Maybe day two, still not killing it. Maybe day three, four, five, and six, still not affecting this guy. But on day seven, this little guy is tired and worn down, and day seven kills them. Okay, so we need to make sure that we're taking things for the proper number of days, regardless of whether we feel better after day three or not. So where do we get all these antibiotics? Well, this is actually a really cool story. See, prior to 1928, we didn't have antibiotics. If you got something like strep throat, or if you got something like gonorrhea, you were just SOL, like you were just out of luck, friends, okay? And so one of two things was gonna happen. Either your body was gonna fight that off, which could take a long time, have really bad symptoms, or it just killed you. Okay, so along comes Alexander Fleming, who is one of my favorite scientific stories, because here's where being lazy, okay, pays off. So Alexander, whose hands are pictured here, um, has these plates of bacteria, okay? So all of this white stuff was bacteria that he plated on purpose. And he left his dirty dishes around, okay, for too long. And what started growing on here was mold, Okay, so we have bacteria and then we have mold. And what he noticed was that in some places where certain molds were growing, there was no bacteria. Okay, so what that meant was that the mold was killing the bacteria. 
okay? So um, to create penicillin, we actually used mold, okay? And we purified some of the components of that mold, put it into a pill, and it revolutionized our ability to cure um, common bacterial diseases. It's really quite fantastic nowadays. We take the gene that's in mold and we put it into bacteria, okay? And we make that bacteria produce the antibiotics. So that's kind of funny and clever and ironic, okay? But all of that originally came from mold. And uh, what a great story of an accidental discovery there. So speaking of discoveries, I really wish I could go back in time sometimes, okay, and just get some data. Let's say we know a disease that's been around for a long time, okay, but it spreads differently now than it used to. So I'm thinking of the first time I thought about this, okay, was the Black Plague. Okay, the Black Plague has been around for centuries. It's caused by a bacteria, Yersinia pestis, and um, we start hearing about the Black Black Plague way back in Europe in the 1600s. It was totally around before then. So why did we get a big outbreak? Well, that's because we started traveling more. We put people on ships and with people went mice and other rodents and on the mice were fleas. Okay. And in the fleas was uh, all of this bacteria. And so when we travel, um, we are introducing our bacterial, viral, fungal, protozoal diseases to populations that hadn't had exposure to them before. Okay, so the fact that we are more mobile and the fact that we are able to better get around on things like airplanes and cars has really changed uh, how fast diseases are spreading. And so while knowing more about them and having better hygiene and personal habits certainly helps, um, the fact that we're such a global society now is a big problem for anybody um, who's working on trying to stem the transmission of these diseases. Okay, and that'll do it for chapter 6.3 on the immune system.